Welcome back, I'm Peter Claussen from Bugs in Cyberspace, and I'm going to continue answering your questions here in part two of the question and answer contest. At the end of this video, I will be giving away three stickers to uh, randomly picked winners. Bug Slayer asks, will you ever sell hermit flower beetles again because there is a website where you can look at websites a couple of years back and I noticed you sold them at one point. I'll pop a little video in here about what hermit beetles are. We haven't carried them in quite a few years now. Um, I guess the reason for that is that they were outcompeted by other beetles on the website in terms of sales. And so we stopped sourcing them and offering them. Um, they were about this long and brown, not the prettiest beetles, not the largest beetles. There was a time in the hobby, maybe a decade ago or so, where they were one of the species, US species in particular, that were sort of easily sourced for me compared with some of the other ones that are in the hobby now. And so I guess their time just kind of came and went, I'm sorry to say. Color, colorfied. I live in Southern Arizona, so house temperatures are around 70 to 80 degrees. Parents are divorced and I want to have some bugs at both houses. What are some bugs I could keep at my dad's that don't have humidity requirements other than being dry and I could come back to every weekend? Um, I hear a lot of people sort of overthinking how complicated their pet bug tanks can be. And a tank is like a miniature environment. It's mostly self-contained and if you set it up correctly and moderate the ventilation in the lid through poking just the right number of holes in in combination with the substrate you're using and what moisture you put into the tank, there's no reason why you couldn't leave for a week or two at a time with almost any pet bug in the hobby and have to worry about it. Uh, mantises, and in particular immature mantises that do need to molt and uh, do need probably every other day or so attention, those might be one you would steer away from. But almost anything else in terms of arachnids in the hobby could easily go a couple weeks without attention. Same with millipedes, isopods, centipedes. Uh, most beetles would be just fine. All beetles, I would say. So really, it depends mostly on what sort of catches your eye in terms of things that you would be interested in. And maybe follow up in this video, the comments area, with some more questions about specific groups, and I'd be happy to make some recommendations on that basis. Basement Pets says, my question is, are there any bugs that in your opinion should not be in the hobby? Um, Certainly anything that would be endangered, with a few exceptions, like the extinct in the wild roaches. Um, there's a list called the IUCN list, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and they have a list of things that go everywhere from completely extinct to extinct in the wild, like the Simondoa concerfarium roaches that I sell through the website. Um, those only exist because they are kept in captivity by a few scientists and uh, mostly by hobbyists like ourselves. And so anything that is sort of threatened uh, definitely shouldn't be kept in the hobby unless you have some kind of permission. There are a lot of people uh, who get permission to work with certain things, usually in zoo 
or university settings to help, um, you know, they're able to take a few specimens out of the wild and under the, that controlled setting, they're able to um, work to reproduce them. It happens in zoos with rhinos and, and pandas, I guess, and things like that too. Let's do a few questions here outside since my daughter came up and decided to do a little bit of cooking and she never does anything quickly in that regard. It's pretty elaborate. She has the day off from work. And so, where were we? Yellow Crewmate says, simple question, how long does it take to sell slash deliver insects and other things? Um, sometimes the simplest questions are the most difficult. How long does it take to sell insects? Um, I guess it depends on who you are. If you're asking about me in particular, I acquire them, I list them on the website, and then based on their general demand, they will sell more or less quickly. A really vague question, a really vague answer, I suppose. If they're orchid mantises, they will sell within the first 24 hours, for example. If they are uh, something that, you know, like, like something common, a cross orb weaver from my yard, unless you're a researcher, um, if you're a pet keeper, you're probably not going to want them, but a researcher will often come along and want a dozen of them. But I can go months without selling a single one if I list them on the website. And in cases like that, I'll often list something and say available on demand or on a collect on demand basis to where if you contact me, I can go out and get it if you need it for research or something. Uh, and then you said, how long does it take to deliver insects? Um, it, it depends on a lot of variables. Uh, primarily, you'll get them in a day or two after I ship them and per the shipping schedule outlined on the website. Beetle Breeding Vincent Gomez asks, when will Emerald Euphorias come back? You're awesome, Peter. Thanks for the quality content. Well, you're welcome, Vincent. And the emerald euphorias, I'm really not sure. Um, I don't breed them personally, and uh, we've only offered them through the website a few times now, and I'm not sure what the culturing status is with my friend. A sun bear with internet access asks how to get a beetle larva or adult beetles. I'm not very good at getting that uh, camera centered there while I'm holding it. It's probably shaking also. I should probably do this with two hands. So uh, I sell beetle larvae on the website. And if you want adults uh, purchasing the larvae and then patiently growing them up and waiting for them to become adults is really your only option. The alternative is to check Google for other sources. And then, of course, uh, you can always go out into nature and poke around, see what you can find. Frank Dutank asks, would you rather use Turkish runner roaches or dubia roaches as your main feeder forever? And for me, that's a really easy answer. I definitely prefer the Turkestan roaches, also called red runners. He calls them Turkish runner roaches, um, to the dubia. And for several reasons, at no stage during their lives do they burrow or play dead. Dubia do both of those things. And while dubia, um, they're quite small when they first hatch out, um, I say hatch, but when they're born, um, they grow to about that long. They provide more of a gut load for pet reptiles, for example, and so they might be better in that regard. But as feeders for bugs, tarantulas, things like that, I prefer the red runners because they never burrow or um, play dead and uh, they don't hide as often as the dubia do. So a definite preference there. Um, he also asks, have you ever discovered a new species of insect? If you have or not, what would you name it? Um, I mean, I would, I would name the first one after myself, just would. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't have any shame in that. Uh, I've discussed this topic a little bit before on uh, my question and answer uh, when people asked the question. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just a cool thing. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, the closest you can get to immortality, I guess. And uh, I've sort of devoted my life to bugs. And uh, sure, yeah, I'd love to have one named after me. 
Another question, same guy. Have you ever been confronted by someone that found you suspicious while exploring the area? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm a bug guy, so I'm, I'm a little suspicious and weird anyway, I suppose. Um, but many times when I've been out in nature, I've had uh, just general hikers approach me and uh, b because I'm, you know, leaning over with or without a butterfly net, uh, you know, flipping a rock over. They're just genuinely curious about what I'm up to because um, I'm that one person that they might see on their hike who is not doing what everybody else is doing, uh, sort of moving quickly down the path. I, I'm in the same spot when they uh, come back down the trail <laughs> that I was in practically, you know, the, an hour before doing something uh, that looks very much the same as what I was doing before. There's a bug in my face. So yes, uh, I'm, I'm a suspicious person in terms of my behavior while I'm out in nature. I have at times uh, been kicked off properties that I didn't uh, realize that I wasn't supposed to be on. Um, uh, let's see, I, I got kicked off of uh, the Warm Springs Indian Reservation here in Oregon one time. I was collecting mantises out there. Well, I was actually staying at a resort there <laughs> to be more accurate and uh, and to coming to or from the resort, I had uh, stopped the car and was exploring the bushes as I often do as I drive down a road and see uh, just a small change in the habitat. I will often stop to see, you know, what's different around there. And of course, I think they're called the tribal police. They, they pulled over and, um, you know, told, told me that I wasn't to be out there doing what I was doing. Um, they were curious. Uh, one of the neat things about almost everybody I encounter is I'm sort of a novelty in their experience. They're worried that I might be hunting or doing something like that. And I'm hunting in a sense, but uh, mainly I'm just out there um, looking at the bugs, which in the case that day were uh, largely like myself. Uh, something from another place, European mantises that, uh, you know, didn't really belong there, I guess you could say, to put it in certain words. Um, and then uh, down uh, Border Patrol routinely stops us to see what we're doing down near the Mexican border when we're in Arizona. Um, if you're collecting near lights at rest areas, um, you'll get a lot of attention from people who, you know, wonder why you're walking around the uh, the structures there, uh, you know, on, on the other side of the wall from uh, the bathrooms, just looking generally suspicious. And uh, what else? Uh, if you're walking around like many malls, things like that, looking at the lights in certain places, buggy places, southern states in particular, um, sometimes uh, security, uh, property security will drive around and tell you to beat it. So, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've had my share of experiences. I, I, you see me looking around here. I think the camera's over here. I'm, yeah, I guess that's where it is. Um, next question from Bug Boy Jax. About what time of year do rainbow scarabs come back in stock? Uh, the last week of March or the first week of April? Pretty consistently every year. September Blue says, you really do live in such a beautiful place. What are you looking for to the most, forward to the most this fall season? A lot of airplanes fly over here, not too far from the airport. Um, you know, this is my favorite time of year, fall. And uh, I just love the changing of the seasons. Um, I like fall more than spring. Spring, by the time spring comes around, I'm, I'm really ready for it. I'm looking forward to the rebirth of nature and uh, all of the flowers and everything, but fall's really my favorite. Uh, it's kind of a cozy time of year. You still get beautiful sunny days like this. Uh, and then once, once the leaves start changing their colors, uh, that's, that's, it's the prettiest time of year, in my opinion. Um, and the bugs are much better in the fall than they are in the spring. You get the, the tail end of everything from the summer, as well as uh, when the rains return, 
uh, everything everything kind of comes out again in terms of the things that love the moist times of year. So it's a, it's a great time of year in terms of the transitional bugs where you get sort of an overlap. And collecting is sort of like that too if you're out somewhere. And if you're deep in the forest, you'll see certain kinds of bugs, but not necessarily that many because it's so shady. And if you're out in an open field, you'll see a lot of bugs out there in the sun. But really in those transitions between forest and um, and fields, that's where you're gonna see the most stuff, uh, where those two habitat types meet. Um, you'll see a little bit of this and a little bit of that from each place. And uh, fall is kind of like that, being sandwiched between um, the best of what's available in the summer. Well, I just got interrupted here for the third time making my video and Thank you for choosing Marriott Hotels. It kicks my video off when I get a phone call come through. You guys get Marriott calling all the time? Warranties about your car? It's time for me to change my number again. I don't mess around with that kind of stuff. I don't give anybody my number. I don't know how these people got my number. It's frustrating. <laughs> all right, let's take a couple more questions here. And then I got to get over to Jesse's house. I've got a spider that I have to take over to him. I collected a non-native uh, spider for him last night. Uh, there's a chance we're going to be on a TV show here sometime in 2021. And uh, I got to drop the spider off so he can submit his videos to be on the television show. Let's see here. Next question from The Wild Martin. Love your channel. It's always very enjoyable and educational to watch your videos. Thank you. Uh, oh, and he has a question up above. Where can we hear the podcast? And so he's referring to the podcast that I do with my friend Jesse. And uh, it's the Shapes in Nature podcast. You can watch the rebroadcast of the podcast show, the video version, on his Shapes in Nature YouTube channel. And you can also hear the podcast at podbean.com. We're going to get it on some other uh, platforms pretty soon in terms of the audio version. And then live, almost every Friday, we have a podcast with somebody. Our guest tomorrow, or today, for those of you watching this video on time, because I upload it on Fridays, we're doing a podcast interviewing somebody about the American bison, which I'm looking forward to greatly. And then the following day, we're doing a podcast, um, an interview with someone who is an artist and does uh, art with nature. Uh, Jesse is uploading the wolf one from a couple weeks ago to YouTube here. You can check that out probably sometime today. And then the interview we did with uh, somebody about sharks <laughs> was really fun. And uh, of course, there's always some trivia and some question and answer sessions that we do with the, uh, the people watching the live stream on Instagram. And so uh, check it out at two o'clock today on Instagram on the Shapes in Nature Instagram channel in the story area. Thanks for your question. And then Aquarimax Pets said, I know many female mantids will produce infertile oothesi if they never mate Oh, if they never mate. Is this true for the orchid mantis? Um, yes, as far as I know, every single mantis species, uh, if the female never meets with the male, she will still lay uh, infertile oothesi, or egg cases. And so uh, ghost mantises are quite famous for this. The orchid mantises will do it too. They'll drop a few egg cases out. And often they do look a little bit different than the fertilized egg cases. Um, and of course, there are a few species too who uh, the males are not known to exist. And so all of the, the entire species consists entirely of females who through a process called parthenogenesis produce viable egg cases that will hatch. And so, yeah, Russ, I know you have an adult female orchid mantis and uh, no male, as far as I know. And you will likely see an egg case or two deposited. They may not look like the ones that you see uh, in pictures on Google, for example. They may be a little bit disfigured looking, but often they'll look perfectly normal. And un of course, and unfortunately, they will not hatch, I'm sorry to say. I'm going to pop the video off here because I got to run over to the other side of town. Uh, as I continue to answer these questions, uh, it will probably be dark because uh, I'm also going on a short hike after that. See you guys again soon. Like I said, got dark out there. 
Next question was from Chance, who said, if I'm too late, probably meant if I'm not too late, how would you recommend studying to be an entomologist? Bugs and arthropods are just like little rad aliens, and I'd love to devote my life to studying them. Specifically, the effects of tarantula venom on the human body, as that's not studied in depth. Um, to be an entomologist, uh, I have not gone to school to be an entomologist. It's not something that I was ever interested in doing, believe it or not. Um, I guess it's just because I like nature and just going outside and making observations. Um, it's just sort of my own personal experience of being out there that I enjoy. Uh, I don't like filling my head with the minutia, the extremely fine details of, um, you know, the chemicals, the elements, the atoms, the molecules, all of those little things that make up, for example, the structural nature of the exoskeleton, um, you know, the organic chemistry, uh, things uh, happening with chemicals at the pheromone level, um, so many other little things that entomologists will end up studying um, and devoting years sometimes to very precise studies about something that's happening within just one species. Um, I can certainly understand the intrigue of um, going on a journey like that, um, pursuing your curiosity if you have a passion for something so specific. And it's new territory. Um, it is like an expedition into an unknown land. Um, you are, in effect, uh, an early explorer, a pioneer, uh, visiting a new place and seeing things and, um, you know, taking on challenges that no other human being perhaps has ever taken on. And, uh, but that's just not for me. That's not what has ever interested me about bugs. Um, I think I said in part one of this video series that I'm more interested in the ecology of a place than the entomology of a place. I go outside and, you know, it's, it's sort of everything that's happening for me as I interact with that environment all in that moment. And it's the plants that are there, and it's the predators of the bugs, and it's the bugs themselves. The bugs, of course, are the most diverse thing if you take a transect or a plot out there in my backyard, for example, or wherever I happen to travel to, to look for bugs. Um, but, it, but it's them there in their natural setting. Or, in some cases, um, and for the last couple decades, not just out there, but making observations with them, having a relationship with them, so to speak, in the sense of, um, you know, them being here in my home, even though they're in cages, I can learn things about them that nobody in a, reading a book or hearing a lecture in a university setting will ever be able to understand. It's kind of like um, taking a psychology class or getting a degree in psychology, for example, if you did all of that virtually or remotely, let's say, and because this is the world we're living in now, but let's say you were on an island or something and you weren't actually interacting with other human beings, but you were studying what it means to be a human being and how a human being thinks. And you were learning all of this from textbooks. And then let's say you, you someday were able to leave that island and then you went out there and you interacted with real people. Um, you wouldn't have any of the street knowledge, so to speak, street smarts. You wouldn't actually, through experiencing interacting with people, um, and part of that is knowing yourself too, which is which is hard to understand from reading books about other people. I mean, you can learn to understand your own mind to some extent, but it's the relationship that you're having with another person that really helps you in a lot of ways to figure out who you are and why you're not that person. <laughs> anyway, 
Um, this is reminding me a little bit of an employee I had earlier here in 2020, um, Marlena. And uh, we had to let her go because of the social distancing regulations. Uh, she had only just started working here. And she had worked in an arachnid lab uh, for a couple years, uh, studied in it. And uh, one of the topics of the research that she was participating in was on, I guess, the relationship between whip spiders, also called tailless whip scorpions, also called amblypigids or amblypigi. And she had read about them. She had studied dead specimens of them. Um, I think they were looking at uh, their DNA, something like that, to establish, determine the relationships between ones and islands in uh, the uh, Caribbean. And uh, on her first day here, we were sort of giving her, Jessica and I, Jessica also works for me, we were giving her a tour of the bugs, you know, just kind of a show and tell. It's your first day here, you know. Obviously, I knew that she was really interested in bugs and had worked in the arachnid lab. And at some point, after showing her a bunch of things, uh, she was holding a, a whip spider, the, which had been the subject, again, of her research for a couple years. And, you know, we were just watching her interact with it. And, and I think that, you know, her, her eyes were starting to tear up just a little bit. Um, it, it, we hadn't realized that she had never seen a living specimen of something that she had devoted so much of her life to for a couple years studying. She had never seen a living specimen of that. And so that, that moment, we, we were failing to appreciate what it meant to her and what her experience was because we figured that she had interacted with these things more than we ever had and that we were going to be learning so much from her about these animals. But um, no, no matter what you know, what you read in a book, what you study in terms of the anatomy or the DNA of, uh, of uh, dead specimens, there is no replacement for seeing a living example of, of something that you have spent so much time uh, devoting your life to. Um, you know, the, the experience you have of holding that animal, I would argue, you know, for one minute will teach you things that you could never learn in a book. It will help you, and this is just my opinion, appreciate what's magical um, what's interesting about that creature in a way that no book ever could. Um, and that's the level at which I like to interact with all of the bugs and with the ecology in general. It's pretty superficial. Um, you know, I find the work and the studies of entomologists fascinating if I can, and we did do a, an interview recently with someone who knows a lot about dragonflies. Um, I can't think of another human being that I would rather talk to, um, you know, for a couple hours about their research um, versus, than an entomologist. Uh, if I can talk to a person about dragonflies and learn some things about, you know, something that sort of falls within the general category that I've devoted my life to, um, you know, it's, it's not just about dragonflies that we're talking about. It's also understanding what, you know, drove that person to specialize in just dragonflies. That's fascinating to me as well. The person is, is fascinating to me in as much as the dragonflies themselves are. Um, but I don't want to spend years going to school, um, studying all of these general things. Um, I did go to college for six years, by the way, but um, entomology was never my major. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, I don't have an interest in, you know, learning very deeply and entomologists they tend to have to special tend to have to specialize in certain things uh, often it's pest control um, or you know uh, things to do with agriculture um, and uh, or you go into the research field or you go into the teaching field um, all of those things if I had you know maybe 17 lives to uh, do different things I might do one of those but um, 
you know, I, I built my business around what I love and, and what I love personally is, is not those super fine details. If you want to become an entomologist, um, absolutely, uh, you know, go, go to community college for a couple of years, transfer to a four year college that offers entomology courses, entomology degree, and just go for it. Uh, that's the best way to do it. Make as many friends as you can with entomologists. Um, in the meantime, social media, uh, it's there for you. You can talk to all of these people. You can find out what they do. Um, I'm probably not uh, suited to answering your question as far as what you need to do next, aside from saying that you need to talk to those entomologists and start thinking about what university you want to get into um, to uh, make your dreams come true. Dark Forest Animation says, I think I'm late, but what is your favorite beetle species? Personally, I like the Pinacate beetle the most. I have ordered beetles from you recently, too. Thank you very much for that. Um, Titanus giganteus is a species that I like to throw out every once in a while. Very giant, large stag beetle from South America. Hope to see him in the wild someday. That would be cool. Uh, Beckett Barnes says, I want a centipede. Do you have any? And if you do, which ones would you recommend? Uh, my recommendation is Scolopendra polymorpha, the tiger centipede from the southwestern United States. Um, I usually have one or two around, so feel free to shoot me an email. Very simple to care for. Uh, you know, any care sheet online will uh, tend to work for the tiger centipedes. Cohen Van B says, my question is, have you ever caught a blue weevil? No, I don't think I've ever seen or caught a blue weevil. Blue is not a color that occurs very often in nature. Um, Olivia MS says, do you have a formal science or entomology education? And I just spoke to that a few minutes ago. Supreme Gecko says, great video. Peter would love to see a video on the pill millipedes, or did I miss one? Keep the info coming and stay safe. Um, I will do a video on pill millipedes at some point. I tend to make videos about something that I have available, or um, I don't know, there's a whole bunch of different reasons why I sometimes feel, uh, or, or make a decision about what video I'm going to make next. For example, right now, I recently went on a hiking trip and I'm gonna put that video together here soon. And I got the velvet worms in again recently and I wanna do a tank setup video about those. Uh, pill, pill millipedes will be on the list someday, Wally. Um, and uh, of course, uh, they would make a great feature on your Supreme Gecko YouTube channel as well. Hype Grind says, hey, I don't know if you will get this, but geez, when are you gonna restock on lots of stuff? Like everything's gone. I get people pretty frequently who are frustrated with um, the lack of inventory available on my website. And you have to understand that my website is now 24 years old, a year older than Google. I rank very well in the search engines for a whole variety of keywords. I do leave listings up like Emperor Scorpion, for example, even though it's been a year or so since I had any available and I may not even have listed them as available, available on the website, um, even at that time when the last time I had them was. Um, and part of that is just to pull people in to Google, I mean, to my website from Google. And I really consider that to be a tremendous service to potential customers. Even if I'm out of stock on something, um, I think that the average pet bug person or potential pet bug keeper, maybe someone who has never kept a pet bug before, they want to find my website because it will really open their eyes up to what is sometimes available in the hobby. Even if I don't have it at that particular moment, um, they'll see that, oh, you know, there's you can get rhino beetles and uh, they're not in stock here right now. And so they'll go back to Google and they'll look for rhino beetles somewhere else. They weren't even aware that it was a thing that you could have them. And so um, I feel like even when I'm out of stock on something that I'm still providing a very important service to people um, about what's possible. Uh, of course, uh, because I've been up for so long, there is a lot of demand. And so I do sell out of things very quickly. Um, and because uh, we are down an employee for social distancing reasons still, um, I am managing the workflow, as I've said here repeatedly on this channel recently, or maybe all here. Uh, I can only put so much up because we're just 
two people. Jessica comes in to work for me four days a week um, and we only have three shipping days um, because we don't want to ship too close to the weekend because these are living things and uh, you know we have to manage the workflow or, or we can't keep up. I mean I don't know maybe I'll, I'll pop in a little video here at this point so you can see how busy I am on Sunday nights. <laughs> And now back to the regularly scheduled chaos that is my life. Over a hundred orders going out in the next two days. Dead stock ones in the freezer downstairs. Who's next? Honey G. How did Parthenogenesis evolve? Did it evolve independently multiple times in different classes of arthropods or only once in a shared common ancestor? Could a species that reproduces only parthenogenetically evolve to reproduce sexually? Uh, this question is very scientific and well above my personal pay grade. Um, parthenogenesis, uh, for those of you who don't know, that's when a female organism uh, like a stick insect, for example, I think all stick insects can do this. The female, if she has never been fertilized by a male, can still deposit eggs and these eggs will hatch. Now they'll essentially be clones of the mother organism unless there's a mutation or something, which could possibly result in a male organism again someday because you just said here later in the question, could it eventually evolve to reproduce sexually again? Yeah, that's, that's a possibility, I suppose. And I do imagine that um, within the classes of arthropods and other animals, snakes can do it too. Fish sometimes change their sexes and can give birth uh, parthenogenetically, I think, too, um, or produce organisms parthenogenetically. Um, I, I do uh, believe that it has probably, through the course of time, um, you know, come and gone even within classes of insects or other organisms. Um, but uh, how it evolved, I'm not really sure. I might guess it was a, a random mutation that happened, um, but I don't really know. Um, that's, that's digging real deep. Uh, Dark Forest Animation says, uh, do slender tenebs like a moist or dry environment? They come from a dry location, and so I would recommend a dry location. Mantid Maniac says, what is your favorite species of mantis? And I would uh, defer to my common answer for favorite questions, which is the next mantis I see that I've never seen before. Um, last page here. Hi, Peter, you mentioned, this is Michael the tortoise. You mentioned that you hope your flame leg millipedes will be breeding for you in the future. Did you have any success with breeding them before and how difficult is it to breed them compared to ivory millipedes? Uh, a critical difference and one of the reasons maybe you don't see them in the hobby as much as ivory millipedes is because ivory millipedes can live for 10 years while flame legs, you're probably looking at about three years for the average one and not all of those uh, reproductive years. And so because it's a shorter lived organism, the number of um, times it will reproduce uh, will be uh, fewer than the ivory millipedes. I would say that their care is about the same. Um, not 100% sure, but I sort of think that flame leg millipedes will um, cycle through their substrate. They eat more, they grow more quickly. They, I tend to keep them a little warmer than the ivories, of course, too. Um, and, you know, because they grow more quickly, they, they turn the substrate over. They convert it to frass or droppings more. And so um, one of the tricks uh, to raising them is probably to replace the substrate um, more often than you would with ivory millipedes. And so, uh, you know, that's, that's a pretty good tip, I guess. Uh, Fucked Up Fantasy says, my question for the video, how do I tell when my Asian forest scorpions gender? Either way, their name shall stay Kevin, no matter what, LOL. Um, so uh, flip Kevin over or put him in a glass bottom bowl. This is the same technique used for sexing uh, millipedes and other things. Um, and look, sometimes with a flashlight, uh, underneath. And what you're gonna want to do before you do that even is go to Google, type in sexing um, heterometris, the genus of the Asian forest scorpion, uh, scorpion. So sexing heterometris scorpion. 
And you'll find some images on Google that will compare um, what's, what are called the pectines, those sort of wing-like sensory appendages on the underside of scorpions. And in males, the, the pectin teeth tend to be a little bit larger. Um, and then there's another thing uh, right between those two sort of, they look like angel's wings, kind of like this. And right in between those, there's the genital operculum. And um, in males, uh, it's oval. And in the forest scorpions, um, and it's different for every species, so double check that I'm remembering all of this correctly. Um, you know, some, sometimes they will count the pectin teeth, which is way more difficult. Normally you can tell by the positioning of the pectines for a lot of our U.S. scorpions, you know, whether they're like this or more like this in terms of their shape, um, size of the pectin teeth also, and uh, the number of the teeth. But uh, I think, so in the male, it's, it's a round sort of, or it's an oval shape for the uh, Asian giant forest scorpions. And in the females, it's kind of a heart shape. Um, and then at the bottom, there's, it's instead of it coming to like one point, like the bottom of a heart, it actually comes to like two points, maybe shaped like a tooth or something you might say. Fishing Compilation says, do you have a Discord server? If not, you should make one. Um, I do not have a Discord server to answer your question. Not entirely sure what it is. Um, and uh, as, as vague as I, I think I used it like when I was playing Pokemon Go or something for a minute. And it was, it gave everybody the op option to chat with each other or something like that. Not really sure what it is, sorry. Ashley Orobona says, it is not a question, but I am happy with my order for the Hercules beetle. You can see more about him here. And then they gave a link, which uh, I never recommend anybody clicks links on, on uh, YouTube, although they said they ordered a beetle from me. So everybody go click that link. It's just the right thing to do. Thank you for your order. Uh, Lieutenant Fizz, or Fizz, what would be your favorite species of scorpion? I think this is the last question. Um, I think I answered the same question in part one. I might be wrong about that. Um, of course, I don't have a favorite uh, species of scorpion. I do tend to like uh, scorpions with larger claws and skinnier tails, which includes both the uh, flat rock scorpions in the genus uh, Hedogenes and also uh, Euroctonus. Oh, I've got an answer for you that I've never given before. It's not really my favorite, but uh, we'll pretend like it's my favorite for uh, illustration purposes. Um, par Euroctonus, no, an Euroctonus. There's so many Euroctonus. There's Euroctonus mar uh, mordax, there's Par Euroctonus, maybe Sylvestrii. Uh, the, and the, another genera is Aneuroctonus, and the species that I want to tell you about is Pococci, the swollen stinger scorpion from California. I love the way that species looks. Uh, a lot of specimens have two-tone coloration, um, sort of reminiscent of some of the, um, the uh, creeping scorpions that are in the hobby in the genus that starts with an O, like Opisthothalamus or something like that. I haven't had one for 20 years, so forgive me on, uh, I think Walburgi or Walburgii might be the uh, species for the one I'm talking about. Um, 20 years since I've had one though. Uh, I don't tend to keep any exotic scorpions. Um, so, uh, I like the two-tone coloration on the swollen stinger scorpion, which is a native here in the U.S., and also their very fat claws. They look very cool, uh, also quite glossy. And then in the males, the swollen stinger, um, not just the normal stinger, uh, there's this extra little sort of elongated hump and then this teeny tiny little stinger that comes off of it. That's kind of funny to look at. So uh, that concludes the questions, and I want to thank you all for the questions. And I'm going to do a drawing and I'm going to put it in the comments area because I need to get this video processing. It's like, I can't see my clock over there. It's like 10 o'clock at night now. And it's probably going to take me like five hours to put this video together still, although I don't have to sit there the whole time. My computer is processing the video and then it's uploading to YouTube. So um, I'm going to put the winners of the contest. I'm going to do that contest drawing on Instagram. I'm going to work that in somehow in the morning. I'm running over to Jesse's um, in the early afternoon uh, to 
uh, do our bison interview there on Instagram Live. And uh, after, while this is processing, I have to fill out this application for that TV show thing I was talking to you about. Um, so it's just gonna be a busy, long night. But uh, my daughter went to pick me up some ice cream here a few moments ago. So I'm excited about that. And uh, I'm excited about turning the camera off and just getting to work on the rest of this. Thanks for watching. And if you have any other questions that I didn't answer or some new ones occurred to you, please feel free to ask them in the comments area down below and be looking forward to a velvet worm video where I do a tank setup. I got some new plants and uh, all of the other ingredients I think I need to make a perfect tank for them. See you guys again soon. Hey, if you like me, give me one of those thumbs up and please subscribe and hit the little bell so you know when I post next. Please share me with your friends on social media. Thank you for watching.